Tyrannus has been collaborating with the EPI over a few years now, first with uh, Sack Wendling, and who turned over the baton to Martin Wolf. Um, so welcome, Martin. Martin is a postdoctoral associate at the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy and is currently the 2022 Environmental Performance Index Principal Investigator. He did his PhD on um, climate science from the Matches, Matches blah, I cannot, <laughs> I cannot say that, the MIT in 2020, and his graduate research focused on climatic impacts of industrial pollutant emissions, specifically investigating how particulate matter emissions impact cloud formation and precipitation. Uh, and he, and prior to that, he worked at Yale. Um, he received, he was the, he was a Mer Zion Science and Technology Policy Fellow at the US National Academy of Sciences in Washington DC, where he worked on sustainability issues and the social implications of environmental change. It is my pleasure then to hand this talk over to Martin. Thank you so much, Dane. That's absolutely a, a wonderful introduction. Uh, hardly recognized myself. I'm gonna share my uh, slides. Um, and let's see, can someone nod their head yes, if they can see them? I see a yes from, from Ding and a thumbs up. So that's that's great. So we can go ahead and get started. Um, thanks, Ding, for the, the wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm actually really excited to, to be here uh, to present our work on the Environmental Performance Index uh, to you and, and to um, all of our wonderful colleagues and collaborators at the Institute for Ocean Science, uh, for Oceans and Fisheries. So our work on the Environmental Performance Index uh, it uses data-driven analyses to quantify environmental health and then ecosystem vitality. Um, and we'll get to how we define these two overarching goals, environmental health and ecosystem vitality, a little bit later on in the presentation. But I guess I'd just like to start by saying, uh, at the end, I hope I've convinced you that the EPI isn't just a report that we publish, uh, but rather it can be a tool uh, that, that countries and policymakers within countries around the world can use to both track uh, environmental trends uh, within their borders and also identify policies that can improve their sustainability. Um, so Dang already gave, gave a great introduction, but just to help you put a, a face to the voice, um, I'm Martin. Uh, and what I am is the principal investigator of the 2022 Environmental Performance Index. Um, so my background, is, as Dang said, is in climate science and atmospheric chemistry. Uh, and while I was in grad school, I was really fortunate to work with many uh, Canadian colleagues, including um, Alan Bertram, who's a professor of chemistry at the University of British Columbia on uh, sea spray aerosol emissions. So the, the ocean lies close to my heart, even though uh, if I'm given a label, it's atmospheric chemist. Um, and as they mentioned, I'm now a postdoc in charge of the Environmental Performance Index, which is housed at uh, the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy, which is a center that's uh, split between Yale Law School and the Yale School of the Environment. Um, so I know that there's a Q&A session after the talk for Iowa students only, um, but if any of the students have any questions during that time, um, uh, not only about the science that I'll try and present today, but also about straddling um, the uh, traditional great chasm between science and policy, uh, feel free to ask me about my experiences. Happy to talk about my time in Washington, D.C. Uh, before my, my postdoc, etc. Um, so I hope that this will be a, a kind of fun and informative discussion. Um, so if there's anything that's uh, incredibly unclear while I'm talking, feel free to, to stop and interrupt me. Um, but I also understand that we have a good chunk of time for questions after the, the presentation as well. Uh, so as always, uh, we're eager to solicit your feedback. Um, one of our goals of the EPI is to kind of keep it fresh and relevant by polling experts in environmental science like you uh, on new ideas and also suggestions to uh, improve our data sources and our methodologies and, and the like. So, so please feel free to um, contact me later uh, or tell me now. Uh, we'd love to uh, hear your feedback. Okay, so uh, what's lurking beneath the surface of the seminar today, you might ask. Uh, um, sorry for the visual pun, but uh, first we'll talk about uh, what the EPI actually is, what the Environmental Performance Index actually is, and also what it's good for. Um, so we'll talk about what environmental issues the EPI considers. Um, and we'll uh, spend a particular amount of time on the marine issues that we check. 
Uh, and then we'll also talk uh, briefly about um, uh, how we derive our results. So how we use data in order to rank countries uh, before finally getting to um, the, the entree of the uh, agenda, which is the results. Uh, so who were the top performing countries uh, in the 2020 analyses uh, for various uh, environmental issues. So uh, we can dive right into the environmental performance index. Um, I said at the very beginning that ostensibly the environmental performance index is a report. Um, and uh, at face value, it's true. The EPI, uh, our environmental performance index, is a report that's now in its 20th year or 10th iteration because it's a biennial um, report. And over that time, it's, it's really grown into something that we're quite proud of, um, especially in recent years under my, my, the leadership of my predecessor, Zach Wendling, uh, who directed the 2018 and 2020 reports, as well as his predecessors before them. So if you trace the EPI back to its roots, uh, you can see that it originally started as something called the Environmental Sustainability Index, or ESI, uh, which was started all the way back in the year 2000. Now, the current Environmental Performance Index, EPI, differs from the original ESI, Environmental Sustainability Index, and then we place more emphasis on uh, really environmental outcomes. Uh, so measure, in other words, measuring and tracking trends and environmental issues rather than sustainability issues more broadly. Um, so since the year 2000, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals uh, have superseded the Millennium Development Goals. Um, and there's been a broader emphasis on sustainability uh, outside the realm of just environmental science and environmental issues, which are incredibly important. Uh, but we specialize in um, uh, measuring and tracking trends, uh, specifically in environmental issues rather than the sustainability issues uh, more broadly. So the 2020 Environmental Performance Index report, um, it's the most analysis that we've done uh, to date in terms of the number of countries covered and also the, the kinds of issues and the number of issues that we examine. Uh, and it also uses uh, just the latest global data sets, not only to check uh, the environmental trends uh, over time, but also to ponder what the determinants of good environmental performance are. So why do some countries do better than their peers uh, is a question that we uh, think and we hope our analyses can, can help to address. So one of the main strengths of the, the Environmental Performance Index is that it takes really several terabytes of data uh, around the world and consolidates them into what we hope are easily digestible scorecards on environmental performance or EPI reports. So uh, as we'll see a little bit later on in the presentation, we offer both uh, global scorecards, so how is the world as a whole doing, as well as national scorecards and, and regional scorecards um, with plenty of information that countries can really use uh, to compare their own performance against their peers and really get down into the weeds if they're interested in specific issues. Uh, so importantly, speaking of specific issues, we track not only environmental performance uh, in the year that the report is released for all of these issues, but we also compute trends uh, to track how a country's scores are really making progress or unfortunately in many issues regressing uh, in certain environmental issues over time. So in the end, what we do is we take data and, and various environmental issues. Uh, in the 2020 report, we considered 32 different specific issues. We compute a score uh, and a ranking for each and then give each country a final or, or really overall environmental performance index score that reflects performance um, in all of these uh, individual indicators. Um, so you might ask, uh, what are these actual individual indicators that we consider and, and really what specific issues do they track? Um, so as environmental data science has grown over the past uh, really decades and, and even really recent years, and the data have become more thoroughly tracked and reported and, and global in scope and coverage, the EPI has, has kind of really grown into something uh, over its 20 years of existence to to encompass a fairly comprehensive set of indicators that track um, a whole variety of different environmental issues. So let's just take a look at, at what they are. Uh, so in, in more specificity, we check 32 different environmental issues that range from things like greenhouse gas emissions to water quality, um, to biodiversity and habitat conservation. And then uh, we can group these 32 individual indicators into broader uh, issue categories. We have 11 issue categories um, which themselves are grouped into two uh, even broader policy objectives. 
So this tiered structure really provides the overall framework uh, for the environmental performance index. So going into uh, all of this in even a little bit more detail, um, the EPI analyses uh, have consistently tracked over its 20 years, um, or I can say at least since the past, since 2006, performance in these two broad policy objectives, which are, uh, we hope they're fairly simple and easy to understand, but we want, uh, we want an environment that keeps people healthy, which we call environmental health. And then we also want good practices and good performance that allows nature itself to flourish, which we call ecosystem vitality. So all of the environmental issues that, and, and uh, the indicators that we use to track the issues, we can divide all of them so that they fall under one of these two uh, broad issue, I'm, I'm sorry, broad policy objectives. So beneath the policy objectives, uh, we have these 11 issue categories. Uh, at least we had 11 in the 2020 Environmental Performance Index. Four of these issue categories fall under environmental health and seven fall under uh, ecosystem vitality policy objectives. Um, so I'll, I'll briefly note that it isn't a perfect system uh, and you could easily make arguments as to why different issue categories should fall under um, both environmental health and ecosystem vitality. Like for example, take climate change. Um, you can certainly uh, point out that there are public health implications of climate change in addition to the um, implications that climate change has on the vitality of ecosystems and, and natural processes. But we hope that um, uh, it makes sense that at the end of the day, the most important thing isn't really how we try and put labels on issues uh, by classifying them, but rather that we're considering them uh, and showing that countries uh, that uh, can, uh, showing that countries through monitoring of their, their performance and, and trends uh, can improve their environmental performance. So within these uh, 11 issue categories, we finally uh, get to the specific issues or indicators uh, that are used to track specific issues. Um, and you can see that, uh, well, the list is, is pretty long and, and I won't have time to uh, read it all today, but I hope it gives you some idea of the comprehensiveness of the analyses that we do for the EPI. Um, but we're also very curious to hear from you uh, if you know of any other good global data sets or other important issues that we're not considering here. Um, we're aware that there are many issues that aren't included in this list, um, but the key is, is there a good enough global coverage of data in order to um, compute scores and rankings for countries? Um, so I don't have time to review and uh, list off each of the 32 distinct environmental indicators in great detail, which is too bad because I'd absolutely love to, but I'm guessing you have better things to do with your Fridays. Um, so rather than just go through and read them out, I'm just going to quickly flash some pictures in front of your eyes and, and help you visualize and hopefully internalize some of them. So climate change is one of our um, broadest issue categories. And then the individual indicators that we consider uh, within the climate change uh, category are uh, the growth rates of different greenhouse gas emissions, including the usual suspects like carbon dioxide and, and methane and, and F gases. And, and by the way, I've, I've been closely following Canada's efforts to phase down fluorinated refrigerant emissions. And I'm so glad to say that uh, Congress here in the United States has finally given our uh, Environmental Protection Agency, our EPA, the mandate to regulate HFC emissions as well. So we'll be uh, learning a lot from our northern neighbors in that process, I'm sure. Uh, we also have other indicators that provide a more, I guess you could say, standardized comparison of climate action, uh, like greenhouse gas emissions per capita, and also greenhouse gas intensity, which measures the greenhouse gas emissions per unit of, of GDP, gross domestic product. Uh, and then in the, 2020, uh, in the 2020 EPI, excuse me, uh, there was also a new indicator, which was CO2 emissions from land cover change. Uh, so converting from forests to agricultural land, for example, there's a, a greenhouse gas emission associated with that change. So we were able to account for that for the first time this, this past report. Uh, so we also tra track air quality and air pollutants in addition to the greenhouse gases. So uh, you couldn't expect to get away uh, uh, by inviting an atmospheric chemist to your ocean seminar without seeing at least one slide on, on uh, air atmospheric chemistry. Um, but the chemistry isn't the most important thing here. It's, it's really the, um, what the issue that we check uh, actually is. And, and what we do is we check the health burden. Uh, the units are disability adjusted life year rates, which is just a measure of morbidity and, and mortality from exposure. It's a particulate matter, um, household solid fuel combustion, uh, lead exposure and ozone. Um, so in simpler terms, we just track premature death from these pollutants. 
And then we also compute the emissions growth rates in other atmospheric pollutants like sulfur dioxide and, and nitrogen oxides. So countries that are emitting more and more of these pollutants um, receive a lower score. Uh, and you might also imagine that there's a lot of overlap between um, the kind of marine sciences implications and the atmospheric sciences uh, implications of these uh, trends. Uh, for example, uh, I'm sure I don't need to uh, explain ocean acidification, but by tracking carbon dioxide emissions, um, as well as some precursors of acid rain emissions, we can, uh, 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 by extension, track countries' contributions to, to ocean acidification and things like that. Um, so I'd also just like to specifically highlight a new indicator uh, that was introduced in the 2020 Environmental Performance Index, um, which was waste management. Uh, so th this has long been an issue on our radar, waste management has. But up until 2020, uh, we didn't feel that there was actually a good enough global data set. Uh, so in the last report, though, uh, the EPI team led by, by Zach and others, they worked to incorporate the percentage of waste mismanaged, which is to say, um, disposed of in unsanitary ways like open dumps and, and really substandardly designed landfills, as opposed to um, greener methods like recycling, composting, and also sanitary landfills in each country. Um, so we'll talk a little bit later on how uh, I, I brought this up because we're also planning on extending the waste management um, issue category to also include things like ocean uh, plastic pollution uh, in the 2022 EPI, uh, which might be interesting to, to some of you. And we also have several indicators relating to um, biodiversity and habitat conservation and, and ecosystem extent as well. Um, so we not only track habitat protection itself, but we also report how representative uh, the conserved areas are to the habitat of species that live within uh, a country. So for example, if a country has, is protecting a lot of grasslands, but um, they don't have many uh, species that live in, in grasslands, then they won't be rewarded as much as a country that's protecting the habitat that's uh, directly needed by the species that live within its borders. Um, and then also in our ecosystem services category, we track the, the loss of forests and wetlands uh, and grasslands on a, on a country level. Um, so I know that this is the Institute for Oceans and Fisheries, so I thought I'd specifically discuss some of our marine indicators, our marine indicators in particular. So the marine protected areas indicator tracks the percentage of a country's total uh, exclusive economic zone or EEZ that lies within marine protected areas. Um, so a top score on the marine protected areas uh, indicator means that a country protects at least 10% of its total exclusive economic zone area. Um, and that 10% comes from uh, the IHA target 11 of the Con Convention on Biological Diversity which says that um, optimally at least 10% of EEZs will be designated as marine protected areas. Oops, sorry about that. Got to go back. Um, so uh, fish production uh, and fish catch is, is increasing around the world, as I'm sure I don't need to tell you. Um, and so we also report on several indicators that measure the sustainability of fisheries practices. Uh, so fish stock status in particular measures the percentage of a country's total catch that comes from either overexploited or collapsed uh, fish stocks. And a top score on the fish stock status means that 0% or none of a country's fish catch uh, comes from fish stocks that are overexploited or, or collapsed. Uh, we'll see later on that countries don't come close to achieving top scores. And the marine trophic index, uh, going further, measures the kinds of fish that are being caught, I, I guess you could say. Um, so this old woodcut uh, by uh, an old European, Peter van der Heiden, indicates uh, that the uh, indicates uh, what you might say is a depiction of marine trophic index. So the the big fish here indicates a higher trophic index, whereas the littlest fish that is being eaten by everything else represents a lower trophic index. Um, so countries that have a higher marine trophic index score have fish catches consisting of species from uh, higher trophic levels, uh, while lower lower scores of marine trophic index indicate the species that are being brought in are further down the food web. Um, so if MTI, marine trophic index, decreases over time, this may be due uh, to the fact that countries are depleting stocks of higher level fish and resorting to bringing in uh, lower level taxa, which is also known as fishing down the food web. And if countries are bringing in fish that have legs and feet on them, 
uh, then uh, they might be fishing in very polluted waters, uh, but that's not something that, that we consider in the API. Uh, so we also recognize that different kinds of fishing practices have disparate impacts on ocean ecosystems. So some like longline fishing that's uh, illustrated here are more discriminate in the, the kinds of fish that are being caught, which is good. Um, trawling, on the other hand, just drags nets through the water uh, or along the, the bottom floor, which indiscriminately catches fish, resulting in a lot of wasted bycatch. Uh, it can also damage sensitive ecosystems at the ocean floor that fish rely on for, for spawning and reproduction. Uh, so the EPI has an indicator, fish caught by trawling, uh, which measures the proportion of fish caught using trawling uh, methods. Um, so this is the slide that Ding has probably been waiting for, but uh, we're not really in the business of collecting uh, data ourselves. Rather, we actually rely on, on databases and collaborations with, with many different data partners. Um, so the EPI currently has you know, over 10 or even over 12 uh, different data partners that we use to, to get relevant data um, to construct our indicators and our rankings. So all of our fisheries indicator data comes from uh, the Sea Around Us initiative uh, right there at the University of British Columbia. Uh, so we're really grateful to have this collaboration with, with Dang and, and Daniel Pauling uh, and others at the Sea Around Us for the great work uh, that they're doing uh, and also for providing us uh, the critical data for our analyses. Okay, so that's uh, a very quick and fairly broad overview of the kinds of environmental issues that the EPI considers. Uh, but now we'll come to the next question, which might be on your mind, which is, how do we go from these global data sets to our rankings, um, where we compare countries' environmental scores against each other? So overall, um, we have three main guiding principles to the EPI's methodology. So first, we, we don't rely on anecdotes um, to inform our rankings and conclusions, but rather we we rely on data-driven analyses. So data um, and facts are really important to us. And second, we focus on environmental outcomes rather than policy inputs. Oh, so that is to say, we don't rely, we don't reward countries for, for simply having environmental policies in place or codified into law. Um, rather, these policies need to be actually effective uh, uh, at improving their environmental performance in a category in order for a country to earn a high EPI score in that category. So just having policies isn't good enough. The policies need to be effective. And then finally, we, we also uphold a commitment to transparency. So we publish all of our data and our methodologies and are always open to discussing our work with interested parties like, like you. So thank you. Um, taking into account data coverage and also quality, we're able to compute an overall EPI score for 180 countries around the world in the 2020 Environmental Performance Index. Sometimes we have data for maybe a few indicators for some of the missing countries, but not enough data to um, calculate a reliable overall Environmental Performance Index score. Uh, just for example, we don't compute an EPI score for, for North Korea. Um, although we have satellite data and air quality um, uh, data and forest loss data, the North Koreans don't um, report other necessary data to international organizations uh, like the United Nations Environment Program, for example. So we don't have enough data to compute a score for, for uh, that country. Uh, however, we're always looking for more comprehensive uh, and um, uh, uh, robust data sets with the goal that one day we'll hopefully be able to compute a score for, for over 200 countries. Um, especially, uh, we're working to include uh, data sets that um, report on kind of small island nations that um, are traditionally overlooked. Um, but we don't think that's, that's fair. We want to bring them into our analyses as well. Um, so here's just a very quick and, and brief overview of our methodology that we follow for, for each iteration of the EPI, so, so every other year. So first, we really take a step back and ponder what important environmental issues are out there that we ought to try and track. Um, then we try and seek recent uh, and robust global data sets that address all of these issues that we're considering. And for some issues, the idea has to die there uh, just because there aren't good enough uh, global data sets on the issues. Um, but the ones that make it through, our team can sometimes work to fill gaps uh, where possible through predictive models uh, and, and interpolation. Uh, but then we move on to compute, uh, to, sorry, to convert the raw data into an indicator 
So the indicators give each country a score between zero and 100, 100 being the, the best score. And then finally, we take all of the individual indicator scores, so all 32 of them, and aggregate them into a single final EPI score uh, that succinctly summarizes each country's environmental performance. Uh, so as the last slide may have insinuated, uh, one of the really crucial steps in indicator construction it is, is determining what the best and worst scores should be. Um, so the EPI uses something called a distance to target approach, uh, where a country's score is determined by how uh, it performs relative to certain targets. Um, so the targets are ideally determined by things like international con uh, treaties and, and consensus, um, you know, maybe, maybe agreements or accords or intergovernmental institutions. Um, for example, the uh, IHA target 11 of the Convention on Biological Diversity stipulates that a country should designate at least 10% of its exclusive economic zone as marine protected areas. Um, so uh, if a country has 10% of its EEZ as marine protected areas, it would receive a top score 100% because it's met uh, that international consensus. In the, absence of, of in the absence of targets that are set by these international uh, agreements and consensus though, we turn to targets set by expert judgment, which is uh, sometimes reported in the literature. Um, or lastly, we do by, uh, we start by relative performance, uh, which is to use percentiles. So the uh, first or fifth percentile for worst performance or 95th or 99th percentile for, for best performance. Um, so despite our best efforts to look for comprehensive data sets, sometimes the data is unfortunately missing. Um, so where possible, we use regressions and predictive models to try and uh, interpolate or impute a country's score. But if we feel that we're unable to do that accurately or rigorously, we'll instead um, leave that uh, indicator out of a country's EPI calculation and kind of redistribute the weight that's normally given to that missing indicator to other issues. And we'll get to weighting in a few slides. Sorry, it's, um, it might be a little bit confusing, but it will become clear in, in the figure in the next couple of slides. Um, I should also just mention that some issues don't apply to all countries, right? So we call this a materiality filter. Uh, it's wonderful talking to a, a group like you because fisheries um, is a really great example of, of a materiality filter. So fishing indicators don't really apply to landlocked countries, at least not the fishing indicators that, that we use. So in this instance, uh, we also redistribute uh, the fishery indicators contribution to the final EPI score uh, to other indicators that do apply to these countries. So once we have scores for each individual indicator, uh, we then compile the scores into issue categories uh, and then the policy objectives, which were environmental health and ecosystem vitality, you might remember. And then finally, into an overall environmental performance index score. So this process of taking uh, many individual scores on specific environmental issues and then calculating a single overall EPI score, uh, we, we like to think that it's analogous to a student's grade point average. Um, so a student gets many individual grades on assignments and, and tests and, and essays, et cetera, over a semester, um, which then get compiled into a course grade, right? But then a student takes uh, probably several classes each semester and each class grade is compiled into an overall semester average. Um, and then finally, a multi-year grade point average. Um, so one thing I just want to emphasize here is that we, we don't only report a country's final overall EPI score. We also report uh, its performance and its rankings at each level below that. So it's policy objective scores, issue category, issue category scores, and individual indicator scores. Um, which we hope allows countries to really delve into uh, the details to see how relative to their peers on specific issues um, that they care about, as well as uh, more generally. So to aggregate these issues into a final score, um, we assign each issue a specific weight uh, or a percentage of the final score, uh, which this wheel demonstrates for the 2020 Environmental Performance Index. Um, so on the outside of the ring here, we can see each of the 32 different individual uh, environmental issues that we check grouped into their uh, 11 broader issue categories, which are then grouped into their, um, um, their policy objectives. And one thing that you might uh, be questioning is, uh, uh, why are some issues given greater weight than others? And, and how do we really determine this weighting uh, scheme? 
Um, so just for example, climate change, that might be hard to see on the slide, but climate change is given 24% uh, uh, weight of the total overall EPI score, whereas fisheries, uh, I'm sad to report, is only given 6%, right? But how do we actually come up with these numbers? Um, what we do, uh, well, I can say that the, the uh, weighting is dependent on, on a couple of different things. One is uh, uh, more important issues as determined by uh, expert judgment and, and kind of expert consensus uh, are given greater weights. Uh, so periodically, we convene panels of experts, give them 100 points, and say, OK, you have 100 points, 32 different indicators, assign different amounts of, of weight to each uh, issue. Um, and then we can go and try and resolve differences if there's, if there's great discrepancies between that. Um, we also take into account the quality and the timeliness of the data. Um, so for example, if we have a, an important indicator, an important issue, but the data is getting quite old, maybe you know, six, eight years back into the, into the past, um, we'll downweight the importance of that in the overall weighting scheme because countries and their policymakers are particularly interested in the most recent data um, to know how they've been performing recently, perhaps since new environmental policies have been enacted. Right? Um, so both the importance of the issue and the quality and the timeliness of the data uh, factor into the overall weighting scheme. We have done some sensitivity analyses, um, which we encourage you to explore uh, in our technical appendix and in our, in our audit. Um, you can find all of that on our website at epi.yale.edu, where we vary the uh, weight of each of the different indicators. Um, and we find that overall, the country's rankings are fairly insensitive to the amount uh, of weight given to each issue because countries tend to do well or worse um, on all issues collectively. Um, but it's an important question to ask. Okay, uh, so now that we have some understanding of how we compute environmental performance index scores, we can turn to uh, what I think hopefully will be the exciting part of the, the uh, seminar, which will be showing and sharing some of our results from the 2020 environmental performance index analyses. Uh, so we encourage you to uh, explore the results in more detail on our website, uh, epi.yale.edu. And if you go there, you can uh, find the 2020 report, uh, the overall rankings, uh, and also rankings for each of the 32 different environmental issues that we uh, talked about earlier. So if you're interested in, in how a specific country does in a specific uh, in, uh, issue, uh, we try and make it easy to explore that data um, in our country scorecards. Um, so just sharing some of the, the broad results with you. Uh, we can first take a look at our global scorecards and trends. Uh, so what we show here is the current EPI score for the globe uh, in green, as well as what the EPI score would have been approximately 10 years ago if we apply the same methodology uh, and data sources to decade-old data and the same, same weighting uh, to, to about decade-old data. So there's both good and bad news you can see. Um, the world as a whole has been making fairly good progress towards protecting uh, marine habitat, uh, which is good. Um, although, as we'll see later, there's certainly some individual countries that still are falling behind in this area. And there's virtually no change, maybe even a slight decrease in uh, global fish stock status and, and fish caught by trawling. Um, and this indicates that we still have a lot of work to do to improve fisheries practices worldwide. Um, so we can delve into country-specific results now. Uh, so this map just shows overall EPI ranking by country with darker blues indicating better performance. And we can see that the more developed countries, specifically North America and Western Europe, uh, do well, whereas developing and underdeveloped countries that have fewer financial and political capital uh, to dedicate towards environmental protection receive lower scores. Um, but this isn't really the most important conclusion of the, the EPI. Um, we hope that if you only take one thing away from the seminar, it's, it's this. Uh, one of the most important applications of the EPI is that it can be used to compare scores not across all countries, but rather between peers or, or peer groups. Um, so these are the overall leaders. We can see that Denmark was number one. Um, Canada was, was tied for 20th and the United States was 24. Um, so even though uh, you know, 20th place out of 180 is good and 24 out of 180 is good, um, we're still falling behind our, our peers. Um, so we try and make it very easy to compare countries uh, to their peers. And we also recognize that it's not necessarily fair or equitable 
uh, to compare developing countries to developed countries. Uh, the disparity in resources and capital, uh, et cetera, will of course result in varying degrees of environmental performance. Um, it is interesting though to compare countries to their, their peers, uh, both by region um, and also by peer group, you can see. So some of our first past peer groups simply separate out countries by, um, uh, by economy or by wealth or, or by geography um, or also by um, you know, common history or, or culture. So we really encourage you if you're interested to go and explore uh, these results and comparisons in greater detail. So in the last, uh, what, maybe five minutes or so, uh, I'd just like to briefly share some results pertaining specifically to our marine indicators. So this map shows the distribution of EPI scores on our marine protected area indicator. So scores of a uh, zero is the, is the worst score and 100 is the best score, uh, you can see. So importantly, uh, the marine indicators don't apply to all countries, particularly landlocked countries. And other times we just don't have enough reliable data to compute the score for each uh, and every coastal country. Generally though, you can see that the results are, I guess you could say kind of bifurcated, right? Many countries, uh, the ones highlighted in, in light blue, like, like um, you know, Brazil and, and, and Mexico and uh, United States, uh, have met or exceeded their marine protected area goal of 10% of their exclusive economic zones. Many other countries, however, particularly in Southeast Asia and Western Africa are are falling well below the, the goal. Um, so while some countries are actually meeting their marine protected area goals, I think it's pretty much safe to say that no country is close to the optimal performance in terms of uh, fish stock status, uh, which as you recall measures the proportion of a country's total catch coming from overexploited or collapsed uh, fishing stocks. And in fact, the best performing country, according to uh, our data from the sea around us, is Estonia, which really only receives a score of 36 out of 100. So, uh, you know, it's safe to say every country needs to enact better fishing practices to reduce uh, ecological pressures on overexploited fish stocks. Moving on to another uh, marine indicator, fish caught by trawling, uh, we can see a similarly, uh, you might call it a dismal picture, right? A score of 100% or 100 indicates that no fish are caught by uh, bottom or pelagic trawling, whereas a score of zero uh, uh, is worst performance measured by the 99th percentile of proportion of fish caught by bottom or pelagic trawling. Uh, so again, we see relatively uniformly poor performance uh, in most countries. Uh, there are some exceptions though, uh, it doesn't really come through on this map, but many small island nations like the, the Maldives or Singapore receive a top score of 100, uh, meaning that they catch no fish through trawling. So our results indicate that uh, most major countries, uh, countries that aren't small island nations, have much room for growth, uh, to put an optimistic spin on it. <laughs> um, and then finally, uh, due to some data constraints, we weren't able to universally calculate marine trophic index scores for all countries. Uh, but the indicator here, um, it represents marine trophic index, 100 being no decline in marine trophic index over recent years, and a score of zero indicating the, the sharpest decline in marine trophic index. And there are some middle performing countries here, uh, but again, uh, there's much room for improved fishing policies that regulate bycatch, et cetera, to ensure that taxa from higher trophic levels are remain fishable for, for years to come. Okay, um, so this table summarizes the top performers overall in the fishing categories. And you can see that Singapore is the, the top in the fisheries category, and many small island nations are, are also top performers. Um, there aren't many major countries that make it into the top 26 spots. Uh, Canada, if you're interested, is 89, and the United States is 122. Um, so again, we encourage you to go to our website and explore these rankings. Um, some of you may also be interested in the uh, trends as well, the 10-year performance trends. Okay, so we're uh, in the last couple of slides of the presentation. But before I wrap up, I wanted to just briefly touch on some analysis that I think asks a really important question, which is um, what drives good environmental performance? Why are some countries doing better than, than others, um, both globally and uh, uh, within uh, peer groups? Um, and we can't answer this precisely, but a really interesting analysis that my predecessor, Zach Wendling and his team did, um, are, are uh, investigating correlations between environmental performance index scores, as well as issue category scores, um, and certain other 
uh, governance, economic, uh, and, and regulatory variables. Um, so just to go over a few highlights here, um, we're mainly interested in factors that correlate or, or don't correlate with good environmental performance. So countries with a higher GDP per capita uh, generally have higher EPI scores, as well as high scores in most issue categories. Uh, interestingly, fisheries isn't one of them. Um, so we also consider correlations with governance issues. Um, so for example, uh, voice and accountability, control of corruption, rule of law. Um, we're suffering a bit of, in the rule of law category here in the United States recently. Um, and we can see a very strong correlation between things like government effectiveness and rule of law, et cetera, and environmental performance. Um, so the correlations between environmental performance and economic indicators are slightly weaker, uh, but not, not terrible. Things like the contribution of services to GDP um, uh, trade, so uh, amount of exports and GDP, and manufacturing correlate less well uh, than some of the governance indicators. And you might be surprised to see that manufacturing doesn't necessarily correlate with pollution, um, at, least, at least I was. Um, so we do have two indicators here. Um, let me move on to uh, the re regulatory uh, uh, aspect. Um, another surprising result of these analyses is that uh, more and more stringent regulations don't always correlate with uh, good environmental performance. So that the two indicators here, ease of doing business and index of economic freedom, um, both correlate uh, moderately well with strong performance in uh, most EPI issue categories. Um, so I think the key takeaway here uh, for this audience is that um, we really don't know what societal, governmental, or, or economic factors uh, are uh, correlated with sound fisheries practices. Um, there's no correlations here, really. Uh, so we definitely need more work and uh, more granular research to determine what the explanations are of good fisheries practices. Um, so the EPI is a continual work in progress. Um, and one thing that we hope to uh, include in our 2022 environmental performance index uh, is tracking ocean pollution, so specifically uh, per capita emissions of ocean plastics. Uh, um, and there's been a flurry of research on this in recent years. Uh, if you know of any great data sets that are available out there, um, we're, we'd be more than happy to follow up afterwards if you have ideas. We're aware of some kind of academically published uh, data sets that we're currently tracking. Okay, um, so I'm going to quickly close off with a, with a quote by Gus Speth. Um, and I'll read it quickly for you, or we can read it together. I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. And I thought that 30 years of good science, in 30 year, with 30 years of good science, we could address these problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, fish in there, greed, and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. So he goes on to say, um, that scientists don't really know how to deal with uh, spiritual and cultural transformation. Um, but I personally haven't given up yet on achieving a uh, good public understanding of environmental science and issues. And I, I hope to con have convinced you that analyses like the EPI that take complex, newly expensive data sets and distill them into a few key numbers and issues uh, might be our best bet to meet people where they are at their level of understanding, not necessarily ours as experts, and achieve this needed uh, spiritual and cultural transformation with data-driven policy. In other words, uh, data can be overwhelming, but it can also be empowering if it's used to present uh, data correctly and, and uh, comprehensively. Um, so congratulations, you've made it through uh, the, the presentation. So very grateful for having been given the chance to come and present the EPI uh, in our work to you. Uh, we welcome any thoughts you have uh, now or later through our emails. Um, and I'll stop here and, and take any questions that um, you have. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Martin. That was very, it's a very, very good presentation. And you, now for, for once, I, I understand what EPI is doing with the data that we provide. <laughs> good, good. Yes. So my question is that, um, your talk on marine protected areas, right? So you said 10% of the EEZ has to be protected by all of these countries, right? But um, some of these 
countries have, uh, some of these MPAs have a mixture of protection levels, right? Some of them are no catch zones and some of them are mixed and most of them really are only an MPA on paper. So there's no real protection on the ground because protection means implementation and regulation. Right, and right. enforcement. So, probably, and, right. and enforcement. So how is this protection, enforcement, regulation taken into consideration in your indicator? It's a great question. And I guess the short answer is um, the enforcement uh, level isn't really taken into account in our indicator. Uh, we use area, um, and the area comes from the World Database on Protected Areas. Um, and you're absolutely right that maybe there's room for more granularity uh, in different levels of marine protected areas. Um, it's certainly something we're willing to work with, with you and your thoughts on uh, in developing a more, perhaps more robust indicator moving forward um, that also takes into account not just designation on paper, but uh, designation in practice as well. Thank you. Um, my question is about the comparison of rich countries and poor countries, right? <laughs> Uh, it's difficult to do them, like you said. So you went into peer countries, but maybe one way to do that is to to normalize the scores against GDP, right? I mean, so you measure these countries from the holes from which they are standing, right? <laughs> you know, you might find out that actually Togo is the best, given the resources they have, rather than the US, where they may be too much waste. You know that, yeah. So yeah. Absolutely, it's a really interesting idea for kind of like a, a, another level of analysis that we can do. Um, there are, we do normalize some things um, to make uh, comparisons across countries um, more equitable, more fair, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Another thing that, um, yeah, I really wanna drive this message home because I think it's an important one, the one that you raised. The, the main takeaway of the API shouldn't be that, um, you know, the United States does better than a country like the Dominican Republic or something. Mm -hmm. But um, it's more fair to compare countries within their, their peer groups. Maybe peer groups can be established uh, by GDP level. Mm -hmm. And what we see very interestingly, and I think very importantly, is that, that within countries that are very close in terms of their financial and political capital, there mm -hmm. is a lot of variability. Um, so I think that the main message of the EPI, the best use of the EPI results is compare yourself to your peers. Don't, mm -hmm. You know, we're not asking you to compare yourself to the, the top performing countries, compare yourself to your peers mm -hmm. and work together, collaborate to see which policies can be um, uh, distributed better. But your point about, yeah, normalizing for, for other, um, you know, economic variables is, is a great one. And we're kind of moving towards that uh, with this recent analysis that I was describing at the end, kind of doing correlations with economics uh, variables and, and GDP. So thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, Simon said that um, he'd be happy for uh, one of the facilitators to ask uh, one of his questions. I wonder why the correlations are so weak for fisheries compared to many of the other indices and whether you have some initial thoughts or ideas um, in that regard. I wonder too, <laughs> Simon, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, part of it could be due to, um, you know, we, we question how accurate the data is. Um, you know, some there's, I think different countries have different accurate accuracies in terms of the data. Um, I see Dang nodding her head, you know. We always, you know, that's not to say that Sea Around Us is, is uh, compiling inaccurate data, but we do the best we can with, with the methods that we have now, right? So um, maybe as uh, data sets become um, more robust um, and with new, you know, maybe remote sensing technologies kind of verifying data, maybe we'll see correlations become better. Um, but yeah, if you have any ideas as to things we could explore about why fisheries don't seem to be correlated uh, while other issues are correlated, um, I'd be happy to talk more about them afterwards. Hello, and thank you for the great presentation. Um, I was just wondering, is ecosystem loss treated the same across a variety of land conversion types? So for example, is tree cover conversion to urban or agricultural land ranked as a greater impact on EPI than tree cover loss with deforestation? Uh, that's a great question. The answer is no. Um, specifically how we track ecosystem loss. Uh, right now we have tree cover loss, wetland loss, and grassland loss. We compare um, the amount of uh, area loss to its baseline, which is 
about 20 years ago when when good satellite uh, you know and robust satellite data was was um, being compiled. Um, but uh, if a forest is converted to agricultural field versus forest con converted to you know a suburb or really an, an urban environment, um, we're agnostic to the conversion. Um, where it does come into play is the um, CO2 emitted from land cover change. Um, so conversion, converting a forest to an agricultural field has a different uh, emission factor than converting it to something else, mm -hmm. right? So we do consider it there, but just in terms of actual ecosystem extent, um, we're agnostic to where it ends up. We only care about you know what's being lost. So I will I will take the liberty and. I I hope this is all right with Simon to ask one of his other questions, um, which was at the beginning. He was wondering, he saw that, you know, in the slide that you had um, where you outlined some of the some of the pollutants, for instance, that heavy metals were included. And so whether that was like why that was a conscious choice and did not include, for instance, persistent organic pollutants, or at least these were not included in the slides. If that right. was a conscious choice, um, why was that choice made? We get our um, pollutant exposure data from the um, Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation Global Burden of Disease Analysis. And so that's where, for example, um, exposure to lead came from. I included it in the atmosphere slide, um, but it really takes into account morbidity and mortality from all sources of lead, be it paints or water or, or soils. In terms of persistent organic pollutants, that's a, a great example of a, an important indicator, an important issue that we don't uh, have or at least don't know of good global data sets for. We might have good global data sets for, you know, maybe developed countries and or maybe, you know, especially the European Union, um, but we don't have good enough information uh, on a global scale in order to include things like persistent organic pollutants um, in our indicating, uh, in, in, our, in our EPI. If, if we're unaware, if you know of a, a good data set on persistent organic pollutants or anything um, that you don't think we're aware of, please let us know. We'll be happy to include it. Um, I was just curious if you had any consideration into using longer term baselines. So rather than 20 years back, thinking about hundreds of years, thousands of years back using um, paleoarchaeological and paleoecological data. Oh, it's such a good question. Um, something that we're considering doing that for particularly are greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so right now, if let's, <laughs> I'm laughing when I say this, but let's decide the United States decides to ramp down its greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we might be rewarded for that in the EPI, even though if you take a look at our cumulative historical emissions going back to the, you know, the Industrial Revolution, um, we would have emitted, uh, you might say, more than our fair share, right? So it's something we're considering. Um, it just boils down to the accuracy of these um, historical data sets. Um, uh, yeah, which are, you know, I think for, for some countries, you can make an argument that there, there's good historical data sets going back uh, this long, but we need to make sure that whatever we do, we kind of apply it to all countries. Um, so that's where some of the data limitations come in, but that's a great idea for future EPI analyses. Thank you, Megan. Okay. Um, uh, to wrap up today's uh, seminar, uh, I would like on behalf of the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries at UBC to thank Martin for his presentation, excellent presentation.